Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about construction and manufacturing, those industries, and how we can get our workers back to work safely. So we appreciate everybody taking the time to be with us today. Um, throughout this webinar, if you have questions, please, please type them into the question box you see up on your screen. That is the basis of a, this webinar series is, is a question and answer type format. We don't want to just talk. We don't want to lecture. We want to hear what you have to ask us. We want to hear what your, your concerns are during this pandemic, what your concerns are with your employees and your workforce during this pandemic, and, and hopefully help give you some guidance and some uh, resources to help navigate you through those, those issues. So uh, th you'll see the question box up there on your screen. If you're using the app, it should be on your little panel there. But please ask away, type in those questions, and we will go through them and hopefully help answer all of those questions that get presented to us. Two entities are, are bringing you this webinar series today, the Houston Area Safety Council and the University of Texas School of Public Health. You can see their mission statements up on the board there. Uh, HASC's mission statement is to build safe workplaces and the UT School of Public Health is to change the culture of health. So both missions are admirable and, uh, and, and both geared to making sure that we have a safe and healthy workforce and workplace. So we hope that we can bring you some, some guidance today and, and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you to our Houston Area Safety Council Platinum sponsors, we certainly could not do uh, initiatives like this without your support. So thank you to our, our highest level of, of patrons, our platinum sponsors. You can see their logos up there on the board. Uh, we, we truly thank you for your, your support. So today, a, a brief agenda. You can see it on the screen if you are looking on a screen. We're going to give you the, the current status of what the current pandemic looks like especially as it relates to Texas and the Houston area. We realize that, you know, Houston is the hub for manufacturing and, and construction in, in the state. And uh, it's, a, it's a big concern right now. You know, how do I get my employees back to work? How do I make sure that there's not an outbreak in my site? You know, I, we, we fully realize that that's a major concern to everybody. So we're going to look at the snapshot of what Texas is going through right now and how it looks going to go through some some terminology with some of our PhD panelists today so you better understand what these terms mean. We're going to look at methods to reduce the risk in your workplace. It's all about risk reduction, right? How do I eliminate the hazard in my in my workplace? So we're going to go through some of that. We're going to give you some resources and some references that you you can go look at on your own and and get some of those uh, educational facts. But more importantly, uh, the, the vast majority of this hour and a half webinar is going to be answering your questions. So if we don't have questions, we're just going to talk. So we highly encourage you to ask these questions so we can we can uh, answer them. The questions are anonymous, uh, so don't, no question is a dumb question. If you have the question, I guarantee you somebody else has that same question. As of this morning, we had almost about 300 attendees registered, so it's a big group today. So we will try to, to lightning bolt through these questions and get them answered. Uh, if you're looking at the screen, you can see our, our panelists from the University of Texas, uh, a, a, a vast variety of expertise, uh, a lot of PhDs, some MDs on this panel to answer some of the, the, the health-related questions. Uh, and then we have some guest panelists today that we're very excited to have. And Dr. Delclose is going to introduce them on the next slide. But it's going to be a, a good group today. We hope to answer uh, a lot of good questions and give you a lot of good feedback. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to George. Uh, thank you, Tommy. So uh, before I uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the situation uh, in the state of Texas and, and more locally, I wanted to introduce our three uh, guest panelists. Um, Dr. Fayez Bojani is a physician, uh, board certified in internal medicine and occupational medicine. He also has a master's and a doctoral degree in public health. Currently, he's responsible for health strategy, planning and delivery for all of Shell Oil's uh, business and, uh, and projects in North and South America, and also leads the uh, global health portfolio for manufacturing. 
for the Royal Dutch, uh, Dutch Shell Group of Companies. Faez is also a very uh, uh, good, uh, excellent supporter of the University of Texas School of Public Health. He is an adjunct faculty member. He teaches our residents. He's also an adjunct faculty member at Baylor College of Medicine and a fellow of the American College of Physicians and American College of Occupational Environmental Medicine. Um, John Hodges uh, is also joining us. He is the founder of Evergreen Industrial Services and has worked as the president, president and CEO of that um, corporation for 18 years. Uh, he's been in the industrial cleaning industry for 35 years. Um, and uh, it's great to have him because uh, many workplaces have a lot of questions about the extent to which they should be cleaning and how they should be cleaning uh, their workplaces. 16 of those 35 years were spent with NCLEAN and its predecessors. He also serves on the board of Evergreen North America um, and uh, also on the boards of the Cystic Fibrosis and CVS uh, Foundations. His primary responsibilities as the CEO of Evergreen North America include the safety culture and the safe operation of the company, but he also works in all facets of the business, including its high-tech service, offering and working close with sales and marketing teams throughout the United States. And then finally, we have Lance and Cecilia uh, Levine, um, uh, husband and wife. Um, uh, they are uh, the CEO and directors of MFI International Manufacturing LLC, uh, stationed in El Paso, Texas, with over 35 years of experience as a contract assembler and manufacturer in the US, but also in Mexico and with partnerships in China. Their experience is mostly in textiles and uh, setting up semi-automatic -auto, uh, operations for other companies. Presently, though, they're working on medical pro uh, products, home furnishings, protective garments, and automotive uh, stuff. And the, the, um, the, the shift to medical pro uh, uh, products and protective garments might, may be very, very relevant, I would think, to the current pandemic. So um, those are our guest panelists. And now I'm just going to talk uh, for a few minutes. Uh, if you can flip the, uh, the slide, Tommy. We're going to talk a little bit about um, the scenario. Every week, we update these slides. Y'all may remember that what launched the reopening of Texas was Governor Abbott's uh, order or series of orders, um, which he uh, published on April 17th, but there was actually the, the start date for the most part of the reopening began towards the end of April, 1st of May. And one of the things that the uh, governor's order said is that they would be following certain data parameters to help guide the speed with which the reopening happened. And so, it's important to continuously look at those numbers. There are many, many different ways to present numbers uh, uh, on COVID. One of the ways that we've been tracking, uh, thanks to our some of our biostatisticians here at UT Health, is what's shown here. Um, this is the number of new cases every day of COVID in the state of Texas, and it was most uh, recently updated on May 31st. It, this curve is interesting. You do see that it has an upward trend uh, going back to um, late March. At late March, you may, middle to late March, you may remember that that was when most of the uh, state was, uh, was beginning to put shelter in place um, in, op in, in operation. And so that was done at a time when the curve was going up for the state. And you see that about two weeks later, which is the average incubation time well, it's the maximum incubation time for COVID-19, um, 14 days after you implement any change, you have to wait a period of time for uh, people who are going to get infected to get infected. And you see that by day 14, two weeks after uh, the shelter in place, the curve started to flatten out. But then even before the governor uh, officially launched the reopening, it started creeping up again for the state. Um, with phase one reopening, it tended to level uh, off uh, at uh, two weeks, and then phase two reopening, which began May 18th, has taken off, and, and it seems to be increasing. Over the last week, the, what the trend has been an upward one. Um, but we need to remember that this is overall for the state of Texas. Next slide, please. And Texas is a very large, um, uh, large and heterogeneous state. This uh, picture here is taken from the Johns Hopkins University uh, website, which I think most folks here know because uh, it's constantly put on TV. But if we focus on the state of Texas, what we're seeing here is what we call incidents or new cases um, in Texas, and they're in different shades of color. Uh, the lighter shades means fewer cases. The darker, dark purple sh uh, shade means 
uh, more cases or higher incident cases. So you see that we have some hotspots around the, the state. In some places near the greater Houston area, for example, or in the San Antonio area, we see that. But also in places like Amarillo, a lot of that may be due, for example, to the uh, meat packing, packing plant uh, cluster that was there. So we take the statistics from Texas, which gives us the overview, but then it's very important, we think, for employers to get very, very local in terms of getting information that is uh, in their service area and using that as one more piece of information to help guide the decisions they make towards reopening. Next slide. So if we look, for example, at the same slide that I showed you for Texas, but now for the Houston area, we see that the shape is similar for Texas, but it's a lot flatter. And I'm just putting up Houston because it's what I happen to have, but we could also look at San Antonio or El Paso, other places. In Houston, everything appears to be much more attenuated, even though if you look toward the right and more recent dates, after the second uh, reopening, the phase uh, two reopening, it's starting to go up again. And remember that we're getting very close now to the two week mark of the Memorial weekend holiday when people were going out a lot more. So we're going to need to keep an important eye. I mean, we're going to need to keep an eye on these important changes because they may modulate the speed with which the reopening happens. And sometimes, uh, if if we do let the data drive uh, our decisions, as the governor said, that may in indicate at some point that we have have to hit the pause button and wait a little bit before going on to another phase. Or if things get really really bad, we might even have to take a step back. Now, some people have been talking about the increase in numbers also being due to uh, there being a lot more testing going on. And that's true. Uh, there are a lot more tests, but our same colleagues in biostatistics took a look at the influence of the new tests and, and the graph below, you see the red line is the number of new tests that are being done every day in Texas. You see that there's a steady increase. It's slow, but it's steady. The blue line though, is the new case uh, uh, curve that we see um, in the upper and uh, the right side of the upper graph, we just reproduced it. But you see that even though coinciding with increasing the number of tests, there's also an increase in the number of cases, the rise in number of cases is much shar uh, sharper, the slope, than it is for the number of tests. So tests are having an effect, but they don't provide the whole explanation. Next slide, please. Now, this is just number of new cases. However, um, there are different metrics that we're using, and specifically the governor said that he was going to look at things like the seven-day trend in new uh, cases across the, street, uh, across the state, but he was also going to look at things like hospitalization rates and the death rates. And uh, he wanted to see if the hospitals were um, uh, able to maintain uh, at least a 15% surge capacity so that they don't get overloaded like has happened in other parts of the country. So these these metrics are actually, these latter metrics are going fairly well. So if we take, for example, the Texas Medical Center in Houston, what you see here, the red line, is the seven-day trend in new hospitalizations for COVID. And you see that it was pretty flat in the end of April and and, and, and up to the middle of May, but it's starting to creep up a little bit. Um, toward the end, toward the more recent days. So we have to keep an eye on this. Uh, it's still well below the surge capacity. The next uh, slide. And it is one of the one of the metrics that we look at to assess hospital capacity. And hospital capacity is defined by the number of beds it has available to accommodate COVID-19 patients, specifically or especially ICU beds, the number of ventilators, and also the degree to which we have sufficient personal protective equipment to protect the healthcare workers, that uh, the frontline healthcare workers that are um, handling uh, these, uh, these patients. So without going into the different metrics, I just show you this slide because there are different things that we look at. You can see in the blue on the left, we look at growth trend, ICU bed occupancy, et cetera, et cetera. And over on the right, we have this gr green, yellow, red uh, warning system that tells us what the current status is. And you see that in general, um, things are going okay in terms of um, of uh, um, bed occupancy and um, and hospital capacity and personal protective equipment, but there's one yellow uh, dot there which is reflecting this more recent increase in trend in the number of tested positive cases. So it correlates with the increase that we're seeing. We need to keep an eye on this because it may influence, as I was saying, the degree to which we reopen. Next slide. One thing that uh, we did want to bring to your attention, and this is not part of the uh, governor's plan, but it could be important, 
is we, we all talk about increases in testing. We have to be testing a lot more and especially to get a better handle on how much of the population of Texas has had or is having the COVID infection, because that's going to be very important for projecting the proportion of the population that might be might have developed immunity to the COVID um, infection. But that requires tests. Another important way we can conduct surveillance is by conducting symptoms. And so one of the things that we wanted to bring to your attention, because it's free, it's national, it's not just the state of Texas, was a little app that's developed by, uh, that was developed at Harvard and that we are using in Texas. It's free, it's secure, it meets all HIPAA requirements, so there, it's, everything's confidential, but it allows any citizen to track COVID symptoms every day for themselves. It says it takes about one to three minutes to complete. The reality is once you get used to it, it takes less than 30 seconds. And um, all of the data are being analyzed by our school, but they're being analyzed in, uh, analyzed in an anonymous, what we call a de-identified ma uh, manner. So we can't track it to anybody, but it does help us looking around the state to see if there are clusters of people with symptoms. And that could also correlate with an increased number of positive cases without the testing necessarily. So here's the information uh, for downloading it and we will be providing the whole slide set to you after the, uh, the webinar. So if you're interested in that and playing with it and downloading it to your app um, or even encouraging your employees to do that, it can be helpful. Um, in what ways can it be helpful to employers? Next slide. So uh, if we go to the third bullet, um, if, for example, if you have your, if your company works in a certain zip code or series of zip codes, this symptom tracker, a lot of people in that zip code, uh, these are regular citizens, report increasing levels of symptoms. Businesses in these areas could use that information to sort of tweak or individualize their return to work plans and their protective measures. So again, it's, it's, it's not really an advertisement, it's free. Uh, it is something we think is useful, and if you think it would help you, then by all means, uh, feel free to uh, download it and test it. And if you have more uh, questions about that, then uh, you have the contact information at the at the bottom. Thank you, Tommy. Tommy, I think you may be muted. Yes, I am. I was. Thanks. So I threw in a few slides on testing because we get this question uh, a lot. And as one of the largest occupational health centers along the ship channel, we see a lot of a lot of employees coming through our doors, and, and a lot of a lot of companies that that utilize our our services. So I get this question day in and day out: What can I do to test my employees or to make sure? my employees that are going to be coming into work or coming back from being off of work are not going to come back into my site infected and spread this to, to 2,000 workers that work in this site. And it's a, it's a valid fear. It's a valid concern. Um, and, and up until now, there, there really hasn't been a good solution for that, right? It's just kind of screen people at the door, screen them for symptoms, you know, do, do the mitigation uh, processes that you can, but hope hope you catch somebody with a fever. Hope you catch somebody that says yes, I have a cough. But otherwise, they're going to be in, inside the gate, right? And it, and it's a big concern. So so when we get the question about well, how can I test people? Uh, I wanted to share that information with you. So you know the the tried and true way that we have to test somebody right now, whether whether it's going to your doctor's office or going through a drive through county health clinic is to get a nasal swab. A nasal swab sticks far up your nose and if you've had it done, you know it's not a very pleasant test. It almost tickles your brain and it gets sent off to a lab and that result can take several days to get back depending on how, how backed up that lab is at that time. I've, I've had my results come back the earliest uh, three days the latest about 10 days and and there's no rhyme or reason to to when you're going to get those results back so sometimes that's not always feasible to employers when they need those employees back to work that day or the next day to wait 10 days to have that test come back uh, in addition it's it's not a inexpensive test either you know there's there's lab charges to it there's ppe charges that get they get tacked onto that so but that's that's the tried and true gold standard test that we have is to swab. 
and send that to a lab. You know, we do have the availability now in the second bullet point to do antibody testing, whether or not that's testing a quick test with a prick of a finger. And that employee can know right then and there, you know, within 10 minutes, if they have antibodies built up uh, to a previous exposure. And then there also now is the, the antibody blood testing that we can take a sample, send it to a lab. But again, that takes a few days to get back. So we've got testing for the actual virus in the body. We've got testing for past exposures with antibody testing. And again, you know, what are some of the, the pros and cons to those things? The nasal swab is going to tell you right then and there, uh, at, well, at the point of when that employee came in to get swabbed, if they had the virus in their body or not. And it's going to take several days to get back. Well, if the employee goes goes to a family function during those seven days and gets infected, you know, th there's a there's a gap there. And, and that's a that's a, a, a concern. The antibody testing, the, the quick testing that we have in the clinics now, uh, there's definitely some pros and cons to that. It's, you know, it's a test that can tell you if you've had a past exposure and that, and if you've built up antibodies to that test, well, there's, there's some, there's some cons to that in that, uh, we don't know if everybody's going to build up immunity and antibodies if they've been exposed, right? That's one of them. Uh, there's some false positives that come along with those tests. Uh, and, and, you know, I think the biggest concern that that spooked a lot of, of professional uh, medical professionals is that the FDA kind of pushed those things through very quickly and there was a lot of uncertainty of how accurate they were. You know, now there are FDA approved ones. Uh, we only use the FDA approved ones in our clinic, uh, but uh, there's some concern there, you know, and, and just because I have immunity, I show immunity. Does that truly mean I'm just okay to go back to work? Maybe not, you know, maybe I've been re-exposed and those antibodies aren't gonna be protective of, uh, uh, you know, for me. So there's a lot of uh, pros and cons to what we have. We do have some solutions that we can test for and test those employees to see if they're infected or maybe they have some immunity, but it's not great, you know, and, and we're, we're still kind of limited in what we can do to, to check for, uh, to check, you know, for, for infection in these, in these employees. What's coming soon, you know, we do have uh, some, some newer quick tests that are, that are coming on the market that have been FDA approved. Those kind of work like the, uh, the rapid strep testing that you get done at your doctor's office during cold and flu season. The rapid flu testing, it checks a, a little bit of a different way than, than the nasal swab does. So those are coming soon. Uh, there have been some oral, oral swabbing tests that have been FDA approved that, that, that show some promise. You know, they're, they're not readily available right now. And the availability of some of those newer tests are just unknown. You know, I'll tell you that, that we at our clinic have, have, have gotten approved to have that quick nasal swab test, but we're not going to have it for at least another month. So that, that doesn't solve a lot of problems for, for employees and employers that want things done right now. You know, we do have the antibody testing, we have the full nasal swab, but sometimes that doesn't meet the full need of, of a workforce that, you know, if your site, or the site that you're going into has the need for 2000 workers tomorrow, what are your options? And you may just be, you know, back to checking temperatures, screening questions, which are, which are good ways to screen, right? But uh, hopefully sooner than later, the availability of some quick testing with 100% accuracy uh, will, will be here and will be in clinics and will be at the gates when, when your employees walk in the door. Maybe there's a quick test to swab, get them in the gate, know right then that they 100% do not have that virus in their body. That would be ideal. Uh, hopefully we're getting there, but right now we're still limited in what testing uh, uh, methods we have. So I'm going to pass this now on to Dr. Janelle Rios with the University of Texas, and she's going to talk about some ways to prevent that virus from getting into your 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 workplace uh, from the get go. So Dr. Rios, Janelle, take it away. Hi everybody. My name is Janelle Rios. I'm in the UT School of Public Health, and I'm going to briefly, very briefly, share with you a well-known and very often used public health tool that serves as the foundation for controlling hazards in the workplace. And many of you are probably very familiar with the hierarchy of controls. Hierarchy refers to the level of effectiveness of each of those controls. Um, and it, it, I think that this is important to frame the rest of the discussion because in, in answering the questions that you're about to pose, 
uh, we refer back to this hierarchy um, to recommend methods that are going to be the most effective for your workplace. Um, surgical masks, they get a, a lot of uh, press, um, but there are more effective ways uh, to uh, control the virus. Um, one is to eliminate the virus from actually entering the workplace. Um, remember, employee self-screening starts at home and tell your employees do not come to work if you are ill. Um, and encourage telecommuting when at all, when possible. And facial coverings are, are wonderful. And I have an array of cloth coverings here that I, I cycle through um, as I leave home um, and that I can wash. Uh, and that's important that they get washed properly and managed properly. Um, so that's elimination, eliminating that hazard from the workplace. And although it doesn't quite work with substitution, normally we would replace the hazard, for example, with a less potent chemical or less hazardous chemical in the workplace. But here, uh, I'm going to tell you some way of substituting. So for example, maybe holding virtual meetings uh, instead of in-person meetings. And that would be a nice way to, to keep people isolated from each other. Uh, engineering controls uh, isolate the, the worker from the hazard by putting in some physical barriers. You see a lot of plexiglass around, especially at the grocery stores, that's where I go, I guess, pretty often. Um, but in manufacturing and construction, maybe there are some opportunities for other uh, engineering controls, such as robotics or uh, HVAC technologies in increasing air exchanges or putting in some inline UV technology to disinfect the air. Um, there are administrative controls, and that includes real solid training um, on how to screen yourself. Uh, you know, at what temperature should you not go to the office? And I think that taking your temperature at home is important because as we enter the summer months, people are going to be hot. And especially if they're having to walk from their vehicles into the office or their uh, facilities, uh, it, they're going to be hot. And I, I do worry about false positives there. So self-screening with temperature checks at home and looking at the symptoms that somebody may have at home giving employees um, the technology so they can work remotely, um, organizing work to limit phys physical contact. And that could be things from uh, modifying shift work, staggering breaks, modifying that workflow, uh, relaxing sick leave policies um, so that workers feel that they are able to um, take sick time um, and they don't feel the pressure uh, to come into the office or into the work site, I should say. Um, one interesting idea that has been floated around is to designate a COVID-19 administrator for your company, um, which is a really nice idea because then you've got somebody, and maybe this person is not a healthcare provider, but somebody who is keeping up with the newest information that's coming out of CDC, uh, OSHA, the World Health Organization, um, and local health departments. So that's that's a really um, interesting idea and could be very helpful uh, for your facility. And finally, and the least effective uh, method of control, of course, is providing PPE. But remember, with providing the PPE, you have to provide training um, because the, the, with an N95, uh, there is some very specific training for donning, doffing, using it, reusing it, um, extended use of these things, um, and of course, fit testing. So I was given two minutes to go through all of that. Um, I welcome your questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thanks, Janelle. And I, you know, I just wanted to highlight too, because I, we get questions, I know, I know George and, and Bob do uh, all the time about, you know, what, what can I do inside my facility or my manufacturing plant to, to help reduce the risk? Here's the slide for you. This is, you know, if you took one slide away from today of what can I do, there's 12 bullet points right there that you could initiate or implement tomorrow and know that you've done a lot to try to reduce that uh, risk. So uh, I think George mentioned it earlier, but we will send everybody the, these slides. So you will have this. This is nothing secret, right? This is, uh, this is the, the basis of uh, uh, industrial hygiene. So we will we'll send you this, but some very specific things that you could do to make sure that your site, your plant uh, is doing all they can to reduce that risk. So thank you, Janelle. Christy? 
Yes, thank you. So to springboard from Janelle's messaging, as we know, as companies are open or are reopening, um, we need to take a multifaceted approach to developing workplace safeguards. And when we think about the categories presented on the previous slide, there are certain drivers of risk that we see in the workplace. So it's, it's really about mitigating exposure and thereby reducing health risks and risk of infection. And a couple of these are, you know, one is the potential role of environmental surfaces. We know that other studies have shown respiratory viruses can be transmitted um, via environmental services with the novel coronavirus. It's more likely to be transmitted person to person, but we really cannot neglect that potential factor of contaminated inanimate surface, if you will, that could you know, play a role in transmission. Thinking about controls that Janelle described, uh, making sure that we implement those properly, whether it's understanding why we wear face coverings and why they're not PPE, maybe it's about the way we disinfect surfaces and there's you know, proper usage and we have to think about the frequency of disinfection as well as the contact times um, when we put that disinfectant on a surface. And then finally, we need to think about the role of our client. And so employers and employees can work together to develop and then implement workplace safeguards. But if the client is not aware of those or perhaps doesn't agree, um, it could disrupt the setting and thereby be another driver of risk of infection. Thank you. Bob, I believe you're up. Okie doke. Well, the coolest kid on the block here, this is the, the safety guy. So uh, just four points. I'll keep it uh, short, but I really welcome everyone's uh, comments and questions because that's the, the most engaging part of this uh, whole affair. So uh, number one, this is Bob's commentary, but this uh, virus is actually labeled as a novel uh, coronavirus, but unfortunately in the media and other correspondence, the novel part has dropped off. And the reason I share that with everyone that's on this um, communication is that uh, there are certain things we know, because novel means new, there are certain things we know, and there are certain things we don't know. So I think it's important that we um, make sure people understand that the rules may change, so to speak. Here, here's given the best a current understanding here's the things we're going to do but hey it, it may change um i would suggest <clears throat> that uh, leaders in the field track what's called the r naught value and that's the in epidemiology that's a number that uh, projects based on scientific evidence uh what would be the number of subsequent infections if a uh uh, an infected person were to present uh, amongst others. I believe the current number is 2.2. So in other words, if you have a confirmed case, um, you might expect 2.2 other individuals to be infected. To put that in perspective, by the way, I think influenza, and I'll defer to my colleagues, I think influenza is around 1, 1 1.5. Uh, and I think, um, uh measles is around 15 but but nonetheless just understand the r naught values an important decision making tool that's number one uh number two is we get i've been inundated with questions about screening and i would just like to underscore that screening occurs initially at home uh, there's been a lot of discussions about do i should i screen for temperature when I ask questions and <clears throat> these sorts of things, but I would encourage <clears throat> all the folks that are participating in, in this uh, webinar that make sure you're communicating with the employees and others prior to their arrival at work for some basic screening activities there. Number three, um, this notion of masking versus personal protective equipment. Um, it has been recommended um, and there's a lot of discussions about whether it's required or not but these face coverings and surgical masks those are intended to keep you from unintentionally communicating a disease to someone else 
whereas PPE, personal protective equipment, such as N95, P100s, PAPRs, that's intended to protect the individual from uh, receiving the virus from you. And I will tell you uh, that these, these devices, uh, N95s and P100s, those, those are in short supply. So here at the University of Texas Health Science Center, we have been triaging those to go to the frontline healthcare providers because there's not uh, so many of those, um, but we've received a lot of requests in that regard. And, and these, these all may spur questions, which is fine. I'm more than happy to answer. And then number four, the, the issue of cleaning and disinfection. Um, I, I, and going back to uh, Christie's comment is that um, the notion of environmental persistence, how long might the virus still be viable if it's on my desk? <clears throat> and it, it varies by this surface, but let's just throw out a number of 72 hours. And so that's why there's an emphasis on hand washing, um, use of uh, hygiene uh, practices, that sort of thing. <clears throat> but one of the things I really wanna underscore is for the companies that are on this call is that please ensure that the, the disinfectants that are being used by your organization are number one, a EPA registered disinfectant. In other words, they're effective for this particular virus, number one. And number two is focus on contact time uh, because you, one can't just go in and mop a floor and then immediately clean it up. There, there is a contact time associated with the effectiveness of that disinfectant. So I'll stop there. Happy to answer any questions, but um, I appreciate all the work you guys and gals are doing uh, to, to, to move us forward. Oh, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff if you want to read about there. I expect a full book report. So. <laughs> Dave, I believe you're next. Sure, this is Dave over in San Antonio. We're just doing a whirlwind tour of Texas here. Christy was out there in uh, El Paso. <laughs> so I have uh, prepared just a single slide here of some uh, resources that are out there. And there are several, or actually many out there for both construction and manufacturing. Um, just to start off uh, from our uh, federal resources, we've got the CDC. Uh, the guidance for businesses and employers as well as OSHA has put out a number of different resources and providing their perspective uh, not only to help employers but also the perspective of a regulatory agency. Uh, I put on here the uh, Department of State Health Services uh, for manufacturers is included in that and then also the U.S. Chamber of Commerce I've also uh, found the National Manufacturers Association, their resources for the coronavirus, as well as the Associated Builders. And, and then lastly, I would like to draw your attention to the American Industrial Hygiene Association. And they have just a, a wealth of information on their website for not only con construction and manufacturing, but a number of other industrial sectors and some very nice information that they have put out. So I would strongly encourage you to look on their website uh, for your uh, specific sectors. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Tommy. Thank you, Dave, we appreciate it. Well, so that, that wraps up our lecture uh, piece of, uh, of this uh, webinar. So. So now what we want to do is is truly open it up to questions. So I, some of you have have already typed in questions in the uh, the little the little chat box there. So so please keep them coming. I'm gonna ask that our uh, our guest panelists show your your uh, webcam if you can, and unmute yourself. So that way we can bring you, ladies and gentlemen, into the discussion now. So uh, there we go, there's Fayez. Um, and if you can at least unmute yourself, that way you can chat with us. We'd love to see you if you've got your webcam uh, functional, but uh, in the very least, we'd love to chat back and forth with you. So I've got our guest panelists again up on the screen there and you can see their, their credentials and who they work for. 
Uh, but let's let's jump into some some questions here. Um, and I'll ask this question to our to our our three guest panelists, and and just jump in and say I'll take this one if you if you have an answer for it. But you know what what scares you the most right now about getting employees back to work safely? What what are you concerned about? What what uh, gives you the most apprehension? What are what are you, some of you, those concerns? Uh, this is Lance Levine. Can you hear me? We sure can, Lance. Hi, um, I'm the CEO of MFI uh, International Manufacturing, and we have uh, a plant in El Paso and several plants in Mexico. Um, and I've been doing this down here since uh, about 1982. So to answer your question, I think um, testing is perhaps the biggest concern that we have. Um, the uh, gentleman who uh, discussed testing and the concerns about it, uh, I think was right on target. Um, the idea that um, you test someone today and tomorrow he gets infected, um, I don't know how you deal with that. Uh, the idea of these rapid tests where the um, immunities may be questionable, and also um, the um, question about whether they have an active virus in their system uh, is really not being shown uh, for, from a rapid test until perhaps six or seven days after the uh, test was made. So um, that's probably the biggest concern, and I'll... Uh, sit on the sidelines until the next question sure that's a so, that, that's a great question go ahead Fias. uh so tommy you know for me uh, i i think everything that has been described including uh, the testing uh, are important very important considerations for me at the end of the day this is about humans and human behavior that's what this is all about right because as humans you know, we have a level of resilience and we have a level where we nor start to normalize things. And as humans, where we cross our limits, right? Uh, and everything that we have to do in case of COVID-19 is around modify our behaviors. Yeah, behaviors starting from home, behaviors starting from personal uh, hygiene, uh, behaviors of not coming to work if you are sick, uh, behaviors of letting people know if you are starting to feel unwell, uh, behaviors of wearing your face coverings, everything, right? So this is about human and human behavior. And we know that that is historically in the, health, in the area of public health and preventive medicine, uh, a weak link, right? So as much as we can educate our people, our staff, our employees, our contractors about what needs to be done in as many ways as it is possible, yeah, uh, will, uh, and, and, you know, even at work, you know, uh, just saying that I have done my training or I've informed the people one time is not going to be sufficient for all. Every single thing from your training before people come to work to the signs and postage where you have it in your site to reminders on a routine basis on a daily basis for people what they need to do is going to be critical if we are going to be able to manage and contain and do some mitigation with this up. Thank you. Sure. You know, there. You know, a question came up about testing, and to, to you know, to Lance's point, and it, probably a question for George. You, what is the percentage of, of, uh, do we know yet what the percentage of people who we know are confirmed positive for this virus will have antibodies? Uh, we don't know the exact number, but the the results so far suggest it's a very high proportion of those who have truly had the infection um we don't know as you were saying what that means necessarily right so 
the type of antibody that is looked for that indicates a past infection is what's called the IgG, the immunoglobulin G. And uh, this is, I mean, the test in and of itself is, is it's not really rocket science. We use this um, test. Uh, we measure similar things for other viral infections. For example, measles is measured with an IgG test. And we know that once you have, you have a positive antibody test, that correlates very well with lifelong immunity. We also have other uh, viruses, though, where the immunity doesn't last long. That's why we get a flu shot every year is because it's not one flu shot and then it's you're, you're, you're clear for the rest of your life. It's because the virus changes each year. With COVID-19, we don't know exactly what its behavior is. Every day we have a little bit more information. And the most recent information suggests that, yes, there is some immunity. Um, that is um, conferred to you after you've had the infection, but we don't know how long it lasts, nor do we know if it's just enough to say, I have a positive antibody test, or I have to have a certain level of antibody that equates with being immune. Most of the antibody tests that are being uh, used now are what we call qualitative tests. They basically tell you the antibody, the IgG is there or it's not there. But if we look at other diseases like measles, for example, that's not good enough, or hepatitis B, it's not good enough, because we know that you, it may be detectable, but at very low levels, it's not, it doesn't equate to immunity. So you have to have above a certain cutoff point. We don't know what that cutoff point is for, uh, for COVID-19. So um, as Tommy presented very well, antibody tests are very attractive. I think they are going to have a role. We are doing a lot of research Every day we have more information, but despite having said all of that, I think it's too early to be able to answer some of those critical questions, not only for medicine, but also for employers, such as if somebody has a positive antibody test at a certain level, does that mean that they are immune to the infection and it's okay for them to work because they're not gonna spread something they've already had and they are over? Perfect. And, and do we know the... Um... The, the false positive rate. If I go and test my employee and it comes back positive, how 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 sure can I be that that's a true accurate test? Yeah. Well, um, it depends on the test. Right now, there are many different antibody tests that are being that have been marketed. And as you said, you know, early on when the the pandemic was really roaring um, in, in the U.S., the FDA did make a decision to authorize the commercialization of certain antibody tests, even though they had not undergone what is usually a very rigorous testing and validation system that the FDA uh, conducts. Basically, since it's called the emergency use authorization, and what FDA did was basically tell manufacturers, look, collect your own data that shows that it's valid, that it works, and uh, go ahead and, and commercialize it. And then when, they, when, when things simmered down a little bit and the FDA came back and looked at it, a lot of those tests had serious problems with accuracy. And accuracy means that, um, obviously what it implies, but it also means that you may have a test that is falsely negative or a test that is falsely positive. Both of them are not helpful because false negative basically says that you don't have the disease when in fact you do have the disease. That could be something as simple as having tested too early after somebody got exposed. I think, Tommy, you were mentioning that it takes several days for the, even the swab to become positive. So for example, here at UT, if we have somebody that's exposed today, we don't test them today for the, for the virus. We wait a few days, at least five days to test them because we know it's gonna be negative today. Um, the false positive is uh, also not a good thing. That means you, the test says you do have the infection when in fact you don't. And obviously, the, imagine the stress that that can cause and the anxiety and, and all of that. Uh, but there is more information uh, accumulating. We, we are doing a research study here at UT. Actually, tomorrow, I'm, I'm the study subject, one of them. I have to go get my blood drawn for it. But we're already looking at some of the results, and we are seeing some false positives uh, with one type of, of antibody, what we call the IgM. The IgG, which is the one that we're really most interested in, the one I was referring to earlier, is actually pretty good to, for it to tell us that it's there. Again, we don't know what it means yet. We don't know if it means immunity or not. Okay. Um, there's some questions about, you know, what what is the industry doing as a whole to to screen employees at the at the gate or at the door 
before they they go in. So maybe I'll open this up. I think Lance and John are both self. They've muted themselves. There we go. Uh, if John can unmute himself too, maybe they can give their opinion on this. Um, you know, what what are you guys doing at, at for your employees? Are you greeting them at the at the door with thermometers? Are you asking them, having them ask questions? You know, the the symptom checkers. What what are you guys doing at your facilities? Um, this this is Lance Levine. Um, we um, are actually doing quite a bit, and um, some of the things we're doing seems to change every week as we learn more and more um, uh, things uh, from uh, what other factories and what the medical community is telling us. But basically, uh, every employee gets screened prior to coming in the plant. Actually, they get screened prior to coming on our buses, our transportation buses, um, for temperature. Um, we have uh, greatly uh, introduced uh, social distancing um, between um, all of our workstations, and we have reduced the amount of people that are on our buses. Um, we have um, disinfecting programs at our plants um, on a regular basis. Um, we have testing on some of this rapid testing available. I can say that um, we have big questions about whether or not they're effective or not. So we're not using it except in very few instances right now. Um, we um, uh, are doing a lot of education, not only for the way the conduct of employees in our facility, but the way that they should be uh, taking care of themselves in their home environments, because it doesn't really help our employees very much if we take care of them at the plant and then they go home and start going out to the discotheques or other or visiting all kinds of other friends. Um, so we um, have lots of um, educational material being put out to our employees to try to uh, talk to them about their conduct at home. Um, in fact, um, at some point later on, uh, I could probably share some of these uh, PowerPoints and videos that the whole industry is putting out on educating their employees. Most of the, these are in Spanish. Um, so, um, you, but a lot of them you can understand what is really being asked. Um, we have switched some of our production to personal protective items, not medical stuff. We're making face masks, reusable face masks um, at a fabric. Um, the, um, as was explained, these face masks are not to prevent the wearer from the virus, but it's to help protect the wearer from infecting other people. Um, one of our concerns with face masks, uh, reusable, was that um, we needed a product that would help reduce the amount of disposables going to landfills. And uh, we felt reusables was not only uh, good for the environment because of that, but also would uh, reduce the costs of the use of, of these kind of masks. Um, I can tell you one thing that I've noticed <laughs> over the last couple of months is the amazing amount of fraudulent products that are being promoted on the internet. Um, the amazing amount of products that aren't even subject to the FDA that are having FDA um, logos being put on their product. So, and, and also the amazing amount of inflated pricing that has been going on. And we've seen even products like N95 masks that are totally phony. 
that have come in. A lot of this stuff has come in from China. Um, and um, so that's basically what we're doing right now. But those are my warnings about these fraudulent products. Sure, and there's a there's a follow-up question later, but I'll, I'll throw it up back to John Hodges. John, what are you guys over at Evergreen uh, doing as far as screening employees? <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Tommy, and uh, and and thank all the members of the of the panel. It's been very uh, you know, educational and helpful. And I will say, with that, you know, th this the whole thing has been kind of a continuous improvement process since uh, you know this all kind of slammed us, you know, unforeseen a little bit in March. And you know, my team has worked uh, very uh, close together. You know, our, our branches are, you know, from the east coast to the west coast, and our most of our clients are, you know, Fortune 500 and 100 uh, companies, and a lot of the knowledge uh, that we receive came from um, our clients, um, you know, HR departments working on 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 different issues, or you know, HSE groups. One thing I will say is that uh, things, you know, things changed, and you know, in 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 periods, you know, how we responded the first week changed the second week, and then. A month into it, uh, you know, things were continually uh, improving, and uh, you know, as far as deconning our facilities, and you know, we had a we had a down cycle uh, in our workload uh, at first when the refinery started uh, minimizing, you know, not not from production, but minimizing, you know, personnel uh, because of the COVID nineteen. But I think that uh, as those numbers, you know, we're, we're starting to see those, you know, coming back up and have been seeing those come back up um, as early as, you know, April. So we had about a three week period where had a lot of people that weren't working in a, you know, 18, 1900 employees that are, you know, scattered all over the United States. And then, you know, we still had turnarounds. You know, some of these areas are confined space. So it's, you know, it's not uh, the best social uh, distancing uh, effects, but, you know, we were transporting, we weren't flying people. So we were transporting large numbers of people, uh, you know, from Salt Lake City or I mean, Houston to Salt Lake and just, you know, keeping everybody busy. And we were doing it in buses. And, uh, you know, we were we were social distancing. So, we, you know, you may have three bus or two bus loads might be put into, you know, four buses or, you know, these type of things that we were doing, you know, for COVID and, you know, certainly, um, you know, testing everyone, uh, temperature, uh, different facilities. I will say this, this, this was kind of interesting to me, but from New York to California, the techniques that were being used by the, you know, pulp, paper, utility, refining, uh, steel, and petrochemical were very similar. So what was going on in Utah and California was also going on in New York and Houston. So, you know, checking the temperatures at the gates, making sure that N95 was available, uh, crews coming in to decon uh, certain areas of the plants and refineries. And, um, you know, I think it's still, you know, if you, I think the last couple of weeks we've seen, um, you know, I think people are, um, are getting a little bit, you know, tired of, of uh, some of the protection. You're seeing some mass drop a little bit. Uh, guard gates uh, lifting their masks to talk, um, uh, you know, these type of things. So you can see, I, I don't want to use the term sloppy, because I know a lot of people uh, are, are um, you know, certainly um, you know, we have, we still have some people that are working from home, but, but very few, but I know a lot of people are very sensitive to this as well as myself, but we're seeing a little change in that area. Um, and that's about all I have. That's great. Thank you, John. So, good hey, hey, this is Bob. Uh, um, I'm just wondering, either George or Tommy, uh, have we reached a point where the temperature uh, checking with regard to screening is moot? It, 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 at the end of the day, if I has, same deal. I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, one could be taking medications. They could be asymptomatic. It, it, the temperature checking that could that be a falling into the realm of safety theater uh tommy if i may <clears throat> so in all of our manufacturing uh sites across us and other countries uh you know we have done all the basic stuff that people have said you know 
educated people to say, don't come to work if you are unwell. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and when they have come to work, we have done the, the self-declaration around the few questions, if you're ill, contact, mm -hmm. the same thing. And then initially, when we had the conversation with our manufacturing leadership, you know, uh, my recommendation initial was that, you know, there is really no clear evidence uh, that temperature screening works. However, uh, because every other manufacturer around all of our manufacturing facilities was doing temperature screening, mm -hmm. uh, our leadership also felt, you know, one sort of obligated, two, there was a pressure from contractors, employees, and others. You know, if you are the lone person out who's not doing it, and everybody from the airport to your, you know, wherever else uh, is doing it, uh, they said, well, Dr. Vajani, we understand the, 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 the piece, but uh, at least let's do it. So at that time, I said, okay, if you want to do it, let's collect some data. So at least we'll know at some point in time uh, mm -hmm. uh, whether we, we are able to gain some evidence, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and temperature screening has been done in the past in the SARS and other, other pandemics. So now from our manufacturing perspective, we have collected over 150,000 data points for temperature screening. Mm -hmm. And now we are probably getting towards 200,000 points. Uh, of those about 15, one five of those 150,000 people who were screened 15 or 18, something in that number, but below 20, uh, mm -hmm had elevated temperatures on the temperature screening with the temperature gun, yeah? Mm -hmm. So we followed all of those people and we find out uh, the vast majority, over two thirds of the people uh, had a positive temperature screen because of the issues with the temperature gun, first of all, two thirds, right? Mm -hmm. So that leaves you a handful. All of those people were also asked to go and consider getting a test done. Only one of those 15 or 18 people who had tested positive with the temperature screen ever got a COVID positive result. Mm -hmm. So now everybody can do the math, right? One case out of 150 or 200,000 across US and you know, uh, uh, so, our leadership is at the present time with this data re-evaluating mm -hmm. whether temperature screening the way we currently do it is of any value or even effectiveness, right? Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, we'll be making a decision on that from, uh, from our group perspective. But I also see that uh, American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine has put a paper out now around that. And they also say that uh, there is very, they, they probably shy away a little bit rather than being, you know, completely uh, uh, final on their assessment. But they say, you know, there is very low evidence, if at all, of anything. And I'm, I'd, I'd propose to say that, I'd even venture to say that there is really no big evidence for it, yeah, uh, at the present time. Now, temperature screening may have some roles if you're looking at, for example, you know, a very remote population where you cannot extricate people out of that and you want to go above and beyond it. But currently in our manufacturing, uh, we feel, I feel that uh, temperature screening has run its course if there was any course. Uh, uh, and, and now we are doing it because somebody else is doing it and we have hard time stopping it because the important thing, uh, sometimes, you know, what you say comes back to haunt you because I said, we should determine why we are doing temperature screening. So what's the entry criteria for doing it? So we, we know clearly what is the exit criteria for it. We, when we start without a, with, without a clear entry criteria, you know, you have to exit without a clear exit criteria and that's the challenge. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Fias. That, yeah, very interesting. I don't know if George wanted to add anything about temperature screenings. Nope, I, I think, um, I mean, it's being done in healthcare settings and hospitals. And there, um, given the nature of the people that enter the building, there might be a greater likelihood of people having a fever when they come in uh, and or the vulnerability of the population that they're going to see or interact with might be an element that would make you err more on the side of precaution. It's all, it also takes two seconds. Um, so 
you know, in my world, the healthcare settings, that might be a little bit different. I do know that the yield is very low. Um, but the consequences of letting somebody in with a fever uh, in a hospital, which is where ill people go, that's not the same thing as to a manufacturing plant, which predominantly healthy people go to, might be more relevant there. Okay. So, so Tommy, I'll just make one uh, uh, footnote here. Uh, I had to take my mom to, to one of the major hospitals in Texas Medical Center uh, for, for one of her evaluations. And uh, both of us, as George said, were screened for temperature. My temperature was found out to be at 95.4, and hers was 95.8. And the screener told us, oh yeah, absolutely fine, just go through. So I don't know what they are looking at, but obviously they're looking at a higher temperature. And uh, you know, I, I wonder whether my temperature ever was 95.4 or not. But uh, you know, there are lots of variations in the instrument and the accuracy of those instruments too which I think a lot of us uh, probably uh, did not pay a lot of attention to going into it. Yeah, so let me just follow up with that. So we did see a lot of that uh, uh, early on, uh, at least in the hospitals I'm with, I think it's better now, but early on we were seeing low temperatures and since the guidance that these folks had been given is don't let anybody in with a temperature of 100 or 100.1 or higher, that was their cutoff. And so when they got a totally unlikely temperature, like a very low temperature, they just said, well, it's not 100. And that, that was from inaccurate use. Uh, and that happened at a couple of the hospitals I'm affiliated with. They retrain and it appears to be going better now. But that is inherent to the device and also to improper technique mainly. Let me, let me ask a question here to our friends uh, in El Paso. Uh, a question was written in that says, you know, with respect to our, our re close working relationship with the border, in Juarez, Mexico. Uh, as we open up the economy, more people that live in Juarez may be coming back and forth to work in El Paso. How do we address uh, flattening of the curve in the El Paso uh, region? Maybe well, I'm um, an El Pasoan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't think I can answer your question. I think um, the only thing is uh, education um social distancing um trying to get people to understand how to have good practices at home um other than that um i'm not sure where we go from here the um one of the things of course that deals with the curve is i guess the more people that you test the more it influences the curve sure um did Christy have any comments on that? Sure, just to follow up, I mean, Mr. Levine, you know, definitely hit, you know, the, the important aspects. And I just wanted to mention, um, yeah, in this, in this global environment and, and we're, you know, a unique community and a close-knit community. And we have come together to address COVID-19 and under the strong leadership of our county, our county judge, as well as the city. And then Emma Schwartz, who's the president of the Medical Center of the Americas Foundation, established a public-private partnership. We have meetings daily, literally, you know, throughout the week. It involves our WARAS partners, and we talk about all the different factors that have already been highlighted this morning. So it's it's everything from PPE to best practices in terms of social distancing, as Mr. Levine mentioned. We talk to the medical device industry and other manufacturing plants and what could be some best practices. A lot of times we are in the weeds trying to figure out what would mitigate risk and what are the factors driving risk in those scenarios. But it is a really complicated question when we think about, it's really our buy, but a multinational community we have. And with borders in New Mexico and Mexico and Texas, there's just a lot of moving parts, but we have come together under that strong county city leadership to address these various factors. I'm not sure if others on the panel might have some arching topics or, or, or comments to make you know, regarding our region here. I will say that somebody wrote in uh, when, when talking about screening and, and the temperature checks, somebody wrote in with a good with a good point you know and it's almost like having dui checkpoints along the road if you know you're going to be stopped maybe your your behavior changes a little bit and you don't drink 
So if you have the, the screening uh, temperature checkpoints at the gates, maybe somebody may be a little bit more deterred from coming to work knowing that they may have a fever or maybe they checked it at home and they have a fever. Maybe they know they're gonna get checked at work, I better stay home. So that was a, it was a point that somebody made. I thought it was relative. Um, you know, here's a question for maybe, for, for maybe Bob. Um, a lot of, lot of information on uh, the, the size of the, the virus droplets and that they you know, should fall within three feet. So we stay six feet away from each other. So what is the current research on, on aerosol transmission? You know, I'm in a I'm in a working environment in the shop in a manufacturing plant. Is this thing floating around the air just by people talking? What and if so, what what can we do about it? Uh, good good question. And I go back to my number one point uh, about what is known and not known about the this novel coronavirus. But what is currently understood um, is that uh, the six foot distance. Uh, having to do with these uh, airborne droplets uh, being a source of uh, reinfection from one individual to another. Um, and and so that's kind of the rule of thumb right now. Now, is it, a, you know, is it driven in, in concrete? Uh, no, it, you know, there's other variables there. Um, but um, the notion of it being airborne like something like measles it is is not the case as of now with regard to the current scientific evidence um but i i guess what i would like to do is kind of drive home uh that point of the um inverted pyramid that uh, janelle spoke to that um the the optics of uh the masks and the protective equipment th those are that's really important, but that's the lower part of the pyramid. If we go back up, there's some, you know, things, some simple things that are tried and true. Although there are things we don't know about this virus, there are certain things we know about it. And those basic things about, you know, educating our employees and others to, you know, don't come to work, hand washing, uh, surface decontamination, that sort of stuff. Then we get down to the masking. Um, so I, I, I'm just afraid that right now in our current environment that because the masking uh, is so optically attractive that people you know, see that or don't see it, but they're missing the, all of those other controls that go up the ladder there. So right. I don't know if that really answers the question, but. I, and I defer to my well, colleague and, on this one. And, you know, uh, the second part of that, and maybe you can elaborate it in George as well. So what about ventilation and filtration uh, in, those, in those spaces? So um, let, me, let me go back to the aerosol versus droplet question, just to add a couple of things. So this is a predominantly droplet driven disease. That means that uh, these droplets are large and because they're large, they're heavy, they fall within three to six feet. That's the whole basis, as was said, for the six feet. But there are circumstances where it can be transmitted as an aerosol. An aerosol is much smaller partic particles or particulates, and they stay suspended in air for a longer period of time. We know that to be true because in hospitals, for example, certain procedures that are done on patients uh, favor the development of aerosols. And uh, for example, intubating a patient, extubating a patient, giving them a nebulizer treatment, for example, if they have asthma, um, mm. uh, suctioning them, uh, all of these things can generate aerosols. The distinction is important because the level of protection is different for our healthcare workers if you're talking about 100% droplet transmitted disease versus an aerosol. With an aerosol, you need a higher level of protection, and the surgical mask is not enough. You need an N95. Having said that, um, it's also possible, and, and there have been some studies that show that a fraction, a fraction of people, uh, you know, a, a fraction of the of the air spread, uh, air transmission of this virus can be in the form of aerosols. But there are a number of things that we can still do to uh, decrease the chance of of that uh, spreading. Uh, universal masking. That means everybody wearing a mask. I'm not saying a respirator. A mask works. 
we know it works. We know from hospitals that it works. It is not as it, it, you do it in addition to all the other measures that Bob was was uh, mentioning. But in hospitals, it's very difficult to maintain social distancing around the bed of a patient, for example. And ever since in the medical center here, we instituted, and we have looked at the data, uh, universal masking. Back in March before we did it, or mid-March before we instituted it, um, we were getting clusters of cases in hospitals. And even though we still have occasional positives now, ever since, it's a, it's a, it's a very clear-cut line. When we instituted universal masking, the numbers went way down. And this is masking, so that's important to, to bear in mind. The other thing is what Bob's going to talk about now, which is the, the second part of your question, Tommy, uh, which is air exchanges. But but masking works, and it works in the community. And I think there's a lot to be said to take the experience in from healthcare settings for those measures, those basic measures of social distancing, disinfecting your hands, wearing a mask, and and contact uh, and identifying and isolating cases that have worked so effectively in our hospitals locally, maybe not in New York because they got hit at a different point in time, but it's been very effective here. That can also serve as a model for the general community. Okay, I think that was my cue to speak was, about air changes yeah. per hour. Um, and so that's one I would encourage each of you, if you've got a notebook, write that one down. And um, within your respective organizations, one of the things you wanna know is what are the current uh, ACH air changes per hour within your organization? But more importantly, <clears throat> you want to make sure <clears throat> that it's not recirculation of the air, but rather changes with with incoming air uh, and to flow through. Now, I realize that this has a um, uh, an impact on your um, uh, utility bill but <clears throat> the last thing in this current situation that you want to do is just recirculate the air that is uh, currently present where all of your workers are um, and so then I, I inevitably get the question and i'll give you the number and i defer to my colleagues on this one but um, in in a clinical setting so let's say you're going to a not not in the hospital, but let's say you're going to get a simple procedure being done in an outpatient setting, um, that the recommended ACH air changes per hour <clears throat> in that setting would be four to six uh, ACH per hour, all right? Okay, and so um, I, I throw that number out because if you think about it, in our current environment, each person could be potentially someone who could infect someone else. So to me, that's a reasonable rule of thumb to shoot for, uh, for air changes per hour within the work environment. I'll pause right there, George, uh, Faez, others. Uh, either uh, thumbs up. I think, you're, right you're, I think the important thing is, is the distinction between ventilation or air exchange, that means bringing fresh air from the outside, mm -hmm. and replacing the existing air four to six times per hour. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, higher, it depends on what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. Distinguishing that from recirculation. And, and recirculating air, I think, is important, especially in manufacturing facilities where mm -hmm. fans in, in some settings are, are widely used, right? Which, which is great. They cool you, they all that stuff, except just remember the distinction. If I take a room and I close it off completely and I put a fan in the middle of the room and I turn it on, not only is that not exchanging uh, old air with and replacing it with new air, it is it is actually maintaining, it's recirculating the air, so it's maintaining anything that could be harmful in the air for a much longer period of time than just letting it drop to the ground because you're constantly recirculating. I think that's the important distinction. And if you don't know in your own company what to do, call your HVAC professional because they, they know how to calculate these things, whoever you contract with. Great, great. Thank you very much. So we've got we've got about 10 minutes left in our webinar and we've got several more questions. So if we can do like a lightning bolt round and just answer, fire some answers off quickly, we can hopefully knock all the questions out and then leave a couple of minutes for some closing comments by our, our guest panelists. Uh, a question: Does anybody know if the if the the governor's task force 
has a health professional on it. It supposedly does, more than one. According okay. to what the preamble of the order, they had several people providing medical advice. Okay. Um, does the symptom tracking app tie into the governor's contract tracing protocol? No, it's a separate uh, thing. The contact tracing is a totally a public health department, state health department activity. The symptom tracker is something that originated from Harvard University. Um, <laughs> and um, it, it, it's separate. It, it can add value to it, but it's not part of the official contact tracing. Gotcha. The contact tracing gotcha. is when you have a positive case. The app is for just tracking symptoms in the community. Sure. Uh, this one was for Bob. As to masks, could you talk a little bit about proper handling, taking on and off storage? Uh, how, how do you properly deal with a mask? Sure. So, okay. So the face, let's be clear on the terminology. So the face coverings, which might be a cloth, uh, let, let's go down the hierarchy. You might have a, a cloth face mask that you've, um, maybe someone has issued you, or perhaps uh, many people are making these things. Um, so you would put them on, but the important part here is that you want to remove them from the back. And then, um, there you go, Janelle's demonstrating there. And then uh, what you want to do is remove them and then wash them in hot soapy water and then hang them up to dry so that you can wear them the next day. If you're wearing a surgical mask, I, I have a visual aid there. If, if you have the disposal, vis, uh, this one, um, these are intended for what one use and then uh, you, know, you wear it for the day and then you ditch it. Um, and uh, that uh, compared to the other respiratory protection, which would be N95, um, Elastomerics. It, 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 look, look, she's <laughs> she's provide. It's like we choreograph this, right? So, um, but the, the, those are um, again to be handled in a certain way. What's unusual is the N95s are so precious right now that we are actually doing reprocessing on those devices um, using a certain sterilization or disinfection process. But I, I suspect the people on this uh, webinar are really interested in at this point. So let me just add right quick that after you wear one of these, a, a reusable face mask or facial covering, uh, you don't want to touch the inside of it because this is the part that's right up against your face. Um, you have to have very clean hands when you're when you're handling this, um, and you really want to handle it by the straps uh, rather than by the actual cloth. Just you know, keep it as clean as possible because this is touching your face. You know, on, on the same line of that, uh, probably a question for for George or uh, or maybe Fias. We do a lot. We do a lot with masking to cover our, our nose and mouth. What about our eyes? Is there any indication that this virus can be transmitted if it gets in your eyes? Actually, there have been reports uh, of uh, of uh, eye infections and redness uh, with this. Not a whole lot, uh, but certainly, you know, it's a mucous surface. It's a wet surface, and 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 you can have the virus go into the eyes. So, uh, you know. Uh, People have said if you have goggles and you're you're working close to people, you, you could wear goggles, but that's not been a common recommendation. George? Yeah, uh, well, sir, in the healthcare setting, it is because everybody pretty much wear that interfaces with patients suspected of having COVID or actually having to wear face shields, which confers eye protection as well as uh, the other alternative is goggles. Um, yeah, I think a lot of the risk of transmission via the eyes only is um, extrapolated from experience with other viruses, not maybe so much for this one. We don't have uh, as much information. I think if you look at other viruses, the eye transmission exists, but it's much less of a risk than the, um, or a, of a pathway of exposure than the nose or the mouth. Uh, probably our last question that we have time for before some closing statements, but, yeah, there was a question about social distancing in the work environment when you have to perform your your essential job functions, you know, uh, and, and can you give some recommendations on maintaining social distance, still getting the job done, 
uh, and this was directly related to you know our, our our heat stress you know environment that's that's coming up, and maybe there's some some risk associated with that as well. But what can what can you do to to maintain social distance? You mitigate the risk, but still perform your job that you have to do side by side with your coworker. Anybody want to take a stab at that? So so in in our manufacturing. Uh, uh, assets, you know, there are certain jobs that we know of very well uh, that require that will not permit social distancing. Certain valves, certain operations, certain things that require a two-person job, right? So knowing that up front is number one and important, and then how you mitigate that, right? So we are not mitigating it by simple masks. You know, we have a whole procedure on how a two person or a three person job can be done. Now those are for 15, 20, 30 minutes, which would, which would be, you know, uh, so, so, uh, so which would, which would go against the stuff. So we have special protocols, special PPEs that people will use. And I encourage that if you have jobs that are standard that require those type of things, you put together a protocol with face shields, face mask, goggles, et cetera, et cetera, uh, for that purpose. Excellent. So I'm going to I'm going to stop our question and Q&A session. And what I want to do is just go, uh, hopefully, uh, John, I see Lance is here. Hopefully John's still on. But maybe just get a get a pulse uh, and an opinion from you guys. You know, what is your what is your optimism moving forward with your industry? Are you are you seeing a positive trend coming with back to work as normal? Uh, you know, uh, can you can you give us your opinion on that? Let's start with Lance. Um, back to work is normal. No. Uh, problem is that as we spread out our workstations, and theoretically, we are eliminating um, the amount of productive people in our in a set space, and therefore our costs are really going up. Um, so back to work is normal. Well, we're working, but our costs are going up. And these costs, if we're going to remain in business, have got to be passed along to our clients. Back to work is normal. Our clients are experiencing the same problems that we're experiencing. Um, so the and then there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty as to what their sales numbers really are going to be. So we have um, lots of uncertainty from our end as far as the amount of support that we can be planning on for our clients. So I don't really see yet a back to work as normal or even living as normal. You know, as a person who is in the elderly stage, um, it's very concerning until we start to get some kind of treatments that are effective and hopefully a vaccine great 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 response i appreciate that lance i'll turn it over to john john how's the uh, the landscape looking for for your uh, industry and your company yeah thanks tommy um you know i do see things starting to get a little bit closer to normal I think, you know, all of us have been challenged to, you know, right size these companies or downsize without waiting too long because it just kind of compounds the problem. So I think, you know, we, we did we made a lot of changes uh, early in the game, um, knowing that we were going to have, you know, some difficulty through the, uh, you know, to the late spring, through the summer. June and July are not big uh, petrochem and refinery months on a normal year. This year's off a little bit. I would say 15% on the uh, the revenue side. You know, we, we go by man hours. I think in March, you know, we were in a lot of turnarounds. We we probably were well over 200,000 man hours. In April, we were 170, and then in May, 172. So uh, we're seeing it starting to open back up. We're, there's a lot of projects that have pushed for the uh, for the fall uh, turnarounds for the fall. Uh, but it's not lost business. It's push push business. And I think most of y'all that understand the refining business, they're, you know, work that they cut back on because they're running 
Um, you know, there's an overabundance of fuel right now because people aren't traveling and flying and doing the things that, um, you know, vacationing as much. And I think that's starting to change, but, you know, we're over inventoried until that burns down a little bit. These refineries are going to throttle down. And when they throttle down the, you know, they, they're not running as hard, but they still have heel and, and uh, you know, it, it's just kind of pushed off. So I, what I think is that you'll see uh, more normal operations uh, appearing after July minus the big project work. And I think 2021, obviously nobody has a crystal ball, but depending on, you know, the antidote for this and, and a whole lot of different considerations, we think 2021 is going to be a pretty big petrochemical and refining year. One last thing real quickly, um, our company was, you know, is obviously very diversified in product line and in client base, you know, from pulp, paper, steel, utility, biggest one being petrochemical and refining. But what I have noticed is areas where some of them have gotten slow, other areas have gotten busy. So it's been a kind of a, you know, a little bit of a blessing for us, but man hours are, are holding strong right now. And if we can get through June and July, I think um, we're very optimistic that we'll, you know, we'll, we'll still salvage a, a decent year. That's great. I think we all, we all hope for the best for, for everybody. Uh, Dr. Bojani, any, any last uh, words of wisdom? <laughs> no, I'll just circle back to where Bob started with novel. So, you know, when we talk about normal, I think we should, rather than saying normal, we should say the new normal, because there is going to be a new normal in place, uh, which is going to be with us for a while. Uh, and we don't know exactly what that while is. But but folks are starting to open up. We are starting to open up more and more. And slowly but surely, as John said, hopefully 2021 will be a different year, yet maybe a new normal. Thank you. Thank you. Unless any of our other uh, panelists have any closing comments, uh, I'll just you know thank all of our attendees. I, I, I saw we had well over uh, 200 today on there. So uh, thank you to our attendees. Thank you to our, our guest panelists. We really appreciated your expertise and your feedback. And uh, maybe one day we'll get to do this again, hopefully on better circumstances for, for a, a better topic. But uh, you know, we thank you again for, for attending and uh, look forward to seeing everybody on our next week's webinar. What's, what's next week, George? Places of Worship. Places of Worship, which is a big uh, hot topic right now, getting people back to church. Uh, so uh, that should be a very interesting topic. So with that, I'll close this out, and uh, we appreciate everybody's uh, participation today. Okay, thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you all. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you, John. Thank you, Lance.